This is Who Makes a Podcast. Conversations with your favorite podcast hosts about who they are, the shows they make, and why they make them. I'm your host, Chris Cookley, and my guest today is John Gaspard. John is the author of the Eli Marks Mystery Series and co-host of Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, on which he interviews magicians and presents a chapter from an Eli Marks audiobook. He has also written several standalone mysteries and produced a half dozen ultra-low budget feature films. In this episode, we talk about his Eli Marks books and learning the secrets of magic tricks, why giving away one audiobook chapter in each podcast episode makes a ton of business sense, using video editing software to edit a podcast, and how much polishing to do during the edit and why he desires a more produced sound. We talk about so much more, and I really enjoyed speaking with John. He's an accomplished author, filmmaker, and now podcaster, and I think you'll enjoy this episode too. Here is my conversation with John Gaspard. John, welcome to Who Makes a Podcast. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. I haven't read any of your books yet, and you know I apologize for that. I have listened to a couple of the uh, the audiobook chapters, you know, as I've listened to your podcast, and they sound super interesting. Oh, thanks. How did you get into writing? mystery books based on magic? Well, I'd written a uh, thriller about uh, Jack the Ripper in present day and like that process. I, like you said, have made a number of low budget feature films. So I have a background in dramatic writing and I spent about 30 years in the meetings and events business. So I have a background in video production and video script writing. So I already kind of had the writing stuff worked out. I liked the idea of having a continuous series I wanted a character who was, uh, let's say, uh, adjacent to crime, but not part of crime. And so uh, I looked around and saw that I had a significant number of people in my life who were magicians, far more than the average person would have, just worked out that way. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting entry point. Uh, these are people who have a curious job. They have their tricks, have curious names. They have to be very, very smart. They have to look at the world in a different way. And if I make my magician uh, divorced from a assistant district attorney, then he's kind of close to crime and can help her solve crimes. So that's, uh, I wanted to do a series. I wanted to, there to be a fun character. And because although I was not a magician, I knew so many magicians, I knew I could find out the things I needed to find out in order to come across convincingly in the books. You said you knew a lot of magicians. Is that just by happenstance? Do you just coincidentally know magicians, or are they are they big in your area? I forgot to ask you where you're even where you're located. Where are you from? I'm in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul on the Minneapolis side. Um, it's a it's a little mix of both because I was in the meetings and events business. Uh, I was often in a position to recommend entertainment for corporate events, and as a result. Uh, got to know several magicians that way, and then just coincidentally also uh, knew a couple in my real life. Most people don't know any. Yeah. So the fact that I knew four or five was, was uh, seemed to me to be a sign. Yeah, that feels a little bit extra, um, not extra, but it, it, it just, it seems like it's, it's not a, a common thing that somebody who's maybe not a magician would know quite so many magicians. I don't, I don't yeah. know any. I know. Most people don't. Most people do not. My brother-in-law claims that he used to want to be a magician, so that's about as close as I can get. That's about average. <laughs> uh, and you are not a magician, but I assume that you do know some magic at this point. Um, well, Chris, I can do one trick pretty well. It's more than me. But uh, early on, I although I learned a lot of stuff, I took lessons from a magician uh, for the first book, The Ambitious Card, because that is a trick called The Ambitious Card. So I learned how to do that and thought, well, I will just learn the key trick uh, in every book because each book is named after a magic trick. As it turned out, the second book was called The Bullet Catch, and uh, about 13 people have died doing that trick. So I decided not to learn that. And have, not going to try that so, one. Nope. And I've sort of stopped <laughs> learning primarily because the issue I would have would be the issue that your average person trying to learn tricks would have, which is I have a very limited audience out there. So 
your average magician who isn't a working magician, but is just a hobbyist, has the issue of, I've learned a new trick. I showed it to my wife. I showed it to my neighbor. I showed it to my brother. I'm kind of out of audience members. You know, yeah. I might be the guy in the office who does a trick and you come by and say, do you have anything new? It's like, eh, no, I don't have anything new. So unless you're a performing magician where you can do this stuff over and over and over, there's, there's really no point to me learning all these tricks. Although I did learn a lot of the secrets behind how they're done, um, primarily so that I wouldn't accidentally spill them while writing the books. Because in the books, the main character, Eli Marks, is a working magician. He does trade shows and corporate events and birthday parties and cocktail parties and walk around stuff, weddings, things like that. And he does tricks and I have to describe the tricks, but I have to make sure that I don't describe them in a way that gives away how they're done. Is learning the secrets, is that something that you found to be difficult to do? And magicians have a, a notorious reputation for not revealing their secrets. Yeah, the secrets can be found pretty instantly on YouTube. Okay. And for just about anything, what you'll find, and I, it isn't just me, I've talked to other people uh, who have had the same experience. After a while, you stop wanting to find out how it was done. Sure. Primarily because usually the answer is so simple and so stupid <laughs> that it sort of destroys the magic of the trick. That being said, you know, if I'm watching somebody do, let's say, the linking rings where they have three or five rings and they're joining them and disjoining them and, and all that. And I know how that's done when it's done by someone really great, like a Jay Marshall, who's long past, but there's video of him doing it. It doesn't matter that you know how it's done. That's that's the the, the actual working of the trick is the least important part. It's the artistry in the performance and the story the magician is creating. And and that's what you learn from, from uh, seeing way too many magicians is the ones who are really great are the ones who have transcended what the trick is and have created something even more magical because of the way they're presenting it. Yeah, they're almost like actors on the stage, right? Like putting on some kind of persona or... There's a, a famous quote... Uh, from a long dead magician who said that a magician is an actor playing the part of a magician. <laughs> Do you think the magicians that you know in real life, are they, are they more or less the same as they are on stage or do they put on a, a persona that you can tell? Not unlike stand up comics, they are very often themselves on stage just projected 10 to 20% more in many, many cases. They're just taking their own personality and amplifying it. However, there are some who are entirely different than what they are on stage, and surprisingly so. They may seem really outgoing and gregarious on stage, and you meet them, and they're quite shy and reserved. Yeah. But that's not uncommon with a lot of performers, where you think, oh my goodness, they just must be the life of the party. And it's like, no, no, they're just a guy who does some tricks. I think that that is probably how I would be if I... If I were in that world, you know, yeah, you have your, your stage presence and then your, uh, your in real life presence. Exactly. How many books have you written so far in, in the Eli Marks series? There are eight books in the Eli Marks series. And they're all based on a magic trick or they're all just titled about around a magic trick. Um, they're all titled around a magic trick. And usually that trick, uh, plays some key element in the story, not necessarily the mystery, but it might be might be something that Eli is going through uh, because he is a little on the neurotic side and, and has all kinds of issues, which is one of the reasons people seem to like him so much is he's really down to earth and kind of a goof. And so, yeah, each one of the books uh, is titled after Trick. How has the response been from magicians to your books? It has been very well. Um, you know, I was originally published with a small publisher for the first couple books, and they weren't getting the sort of traction they wanted, and neither was I. So I bought back the rights and have been self-published ever since. And the conversation I had with the publisher early on was she said, oh, great, we have a built-in audience. Uh, magicians will buy this book. And I said, I don't think that's true. I think the same percentage of uh, the population that enjoys mysteries Take that number, let's say that's 8%, I'm making that up. I think 8% of magicians will enjoy the books as well. Because just because you're in, into magic doesn't need, mean you necessarily want to read a mystery about it. Right. That being said, the magicians who have read them have been very kind and uh, very big fans. And in fact, I got uh, an email a couple years back, sort of surprisingly, from Teller of Penn & Teller. Really? 
who had read one of the books and he complimented the magic and said it was very, he said, normally books about magicians don't get the magic right or get the life right. Uh, yours is very true to life. So I thought, well, that's great. Uh, he uh, he also uh, admitted that he he had guessed wrong as to who the killer was. So <laughs> I haven't I haven't fooled Penn and Teller, but I have fooled Teller. Yeah, you can get half of a trophy, half of a yeah. fooled us trophy. Ex- I th- exactly. I can't remember. Is he the one that speaks or no? He does not speak. He does not speak. Okay. He does not speak. Well, that, well he does not speak on stage. I sure. mean, you can find yeah. videos of he gives lectures and he talks and he's quite quite charming and funny and eloquent. Back to that persona. Yeah. Exactly. So he, on your podcast, you interview magicians. H- have you reached out to him to see if he would come on? I have not um, for a couple reasons. One, I don't think he would. The other thing is the the podcast is sort of a weird bird in that the, the, the premise behind it is that uh, I, I have uh, eight books and therefore I have eight audio books uh, because a friend of mine who's a professional voice talent recorded all eight of them for me and did a great job. And I thought there's got to be a way to promote the series by giving things away. That's a very big thing in uh, self-publishing is what do you give away to to, uh, to act as a funnel to get people into your series. Mm-hmm. And I thought, why don't I just do a podcast where each episode you'd get to hear one chapter from the book so that over the course of a year, 24 episodes, you'd hear the entire book. And then I thought that's, I don't know, kind of dumb. Maybe dumb isn't the right word. It's sort of boring. So I thought, well, why don't I do an interview with someone who can talk about something going on in that chapter to kind of bring things to life a little more? We call it the DVD extras that you might get on a movie. Yep. For example, the first or second chapter in The Ambitious Card, which is the first book in the series and the first book in the podcast, uh, has just a kind of a throwaway mention about a magician named Max Molini who worked around the turn of the 19, 1900, 1910, 1920 in there. Uh, and there's a great magician in New York right now named Steve Cohen, who does a weekly show uh, at a hotel in New York, but he also is an expert on Max Molini and was actually just finishing a book on Max. So we brought him on and for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, he fills us in on who is Max Molini. Then you listen to that chapter and it, it sort of fills things out. Uh, and that was the idea that each chapter, we'd find something to dig down a little bit further in and then find someone who could be uh, an expert in that area. Usually it's a magician, although we have gone outside of that. Uh, in the in the books, Eli's Uncle Harry, who's in, in his 80s and is a master magician, having done everything over the years, one of his hobbies is he collects albums, stand-up comedy albums of people who he has worked with. He's either open for them or they've opened for him over the years. Meaning that whenever he's in a record store, he likes to dig in and find the old Smothers Brothers, Lily Tomlin, Flip Wilson, George Carlin, all the old uh, LPs. And so for that chapter, we brought on a guy named Wayne Fetterman. Wayne is a comedian, but also an adjunct professor at the school in LA, uh, UCLA, I think. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe it's USC. Anyway, he he runs a course on the history of comedy and has a a terrific podcast on the history of stand-up comedy. uh, And as a subset of that, knows a lot about comedy albums. And so we had him on to talk about Uncle Harry's collection and and, what he thought of the things that Harry picked out. So usually it's a magician, but often it's just an expert in the field who can tell us more about what's going on in that chapter. And do you, are you paying a lot of attention to the world of magic? Like, do you know who these magicians are or do you have people suggesting magicians to you to bring them on? The, the world of magic is remarkably small. So the, the, there've been a couple instances where I've reached out and said, who'd be a good person to talk about this thing or just sort of reinforce, Hey, is, is this the right guy to talk about this? And I've gotten the answer. Yes, that's the right person to talk about that. And I have also had a couple of magicians who've reached out and said, I love the show. I'd love to be on it. Can I be? And I would email back and say, here's a list of the topics I'm looking for. Can you speak to one of these? And if they can, then they come on. So that's sort of the process. I don't know if it's true of other niche communities like this, but in the world of magic, the people are really, really open and uh, willing to answer your emails. I've had very few people say no. um, And usually it's more of a... um, of a scheduling thing. Uh, I've had some instances of bigger names who are performers who uh, do magic, 
Uh, for example, Neil Patrick Harris yeah. does magic. Jason Alexander does magic. And I've reached out to their people and have not got anything back on that. But when it comes to working magicians uh, who might you know show up on Penn and Teller Fool Us, it's really easy to get a hold of them. And most of them are, are wide open to as long as their schedule allows it to uh, come and talk about this particular topic. Now you've said we a couple times as you've been talking about your podcast. You do make your show with a co-host. So who who is your co-host? My co-host is a guy named Jim Cunningham. And he did the audiobooks, right? He did the audiobooks. Um, yeah, Jim Cunningham is a, a talent here in the Twin Cities. He uh, is an announcer, was an announcer for years at the Minnesota Twins. Uh, he did the same thing for the hockey team in St. Paul. He's had a show out at the Renaissance Festival for, I think, 30-some years. And I met him through the meetings and events business when we became friends. And he has a brother who's a magician. He doesn't make his living at it, but he is a, a you know semi-professional magician. And Jim can do some magic and does a Halloween kind of spook show that involves magic. And that's what sort of sparked my interest to, in it to begin with, where all of a sudden I knew a couple of magicians that I, I hadn't known before. And so he helped uh, in getting me up to speed on finding the right people to learn from, to write the books. And then it was his suggestion to do the audio books. And when the time came to do this podcast, I thought, well, that makes perfect sense because he's the voice of the stories people will be listening to. And he also has an interest in magic and is a professional voice talent and used to have a radio show and knows how to be on microphone. Yeah. He's a perfect co-host. Kind of a perfect storm there. Yes, exactly. And it's ideal for him because he performers lead complicated lives and are often off doing different projects and and it, so his only obligation is to show up and ask questions and listen, and he doesn't have to do any of the production end of it, which is great for him. I think you said that you started your podcast initially as a means to market the audiobooks. Has it has it evolved into something more than that? Do you look forward to the conversations with the magicians? I mean, I, obviously, I assume that you, you do look forward to them. I mean, do you look forward to them maybe more than the idea of putting out another chapter of the audiobook. Does that make sense? I'll say this. I've never been disappointed in chatting with somebody. And we've been absolutely blown away with the people who have said yes. Uh, like I say, it's a small community. Uh, a lot of the people who are really, really well known within the magic community are not well known to the public. But if you say their name to another magician, it's like, oh my goodness, what? He's on? He's coming on? Really? She's coming on. That's fantastic. Uh, so that is really the most fun part is, you know, sitting down with them for an hour, hour and a half uh, and just chatting. The, the nice thing about our podcast is unlike other podcasts that have magicians on it, is we're not looking for their backstory. We're yeah. not looking for uh, looking at the span of their career. It's anything that the audience needs to know about them. I say in the introduction and then it's really, let's focus on this one topic. For example, we uh, have an episode coming up uh, in a bit with a guy named Harrison Greenbaum. And Harrison Greenbaum is a stand-up comic and a magician, and he is excellent in both those capacities. And he ha gave a lecture uh, at some magic uh, convention, which was titled, You're All Terrible. And it was about how terrible magicians are and why they're terrible. And we're looking at in this second season, because Eli is teaching someone how to be a magician for a movie in the stories, we're looking at what, what is it that makes a good magician? What is it that makes a bad magician? And to be able to sit down with someone like Harrison, who is hysterical, but who also has really well-grounded opinions on what's good in magic and what's bad in magic. I mean, it's just, it's, as I said to Jim on one of our last episodes, I'm not even sure I care if anybody else is listening. The two of us are having so much fun. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's definitely a fantastic way to approach it. Do you listen to a lot of podcasts or any podcasts? Yes. Yeah, so actually, one of the reasons that I ended up doing it was because I, I had listened to so many and there were some that I really, really liked and some that I saw. There are several really good podcasts about magic, about magicians. I listen to those because I'm always trying to learn more stuff so that I'm smart like Eli. And then I've also listened to a lot of books on self-publishing because I'm doing all, all my own publishing, and that's very helpful. And then there are just, you know, some entertaining ones that I enjoy, like, you know, Mark Marin or Jimmy Pardo that are just sort of fun to listen to. 
Do you have any particular show or host that you're trying to emulate or maybe that you look up to as far as how you make your show? Well, I know that um, what James Blatch is doing uh, with the self-publishing show, uh, in fact, he and I have talked about that. I used a lot of what he and Mark do as a template for what I wanted to do because I knew going in that every episode would have an existing piece of audio, which is the that chap- chapter from the book. So that's done. I don't need to worry about that. Uh, it would have an interview, which had to be scheduled and um like we're doing now, recorded and then edited and prepped. And James's team does a lot more. Uh, they dig down a lot more than I do, but I do an outline of what was said in the interview so that when it comes time for us to talk about it, we know what it is. And then I have to sit down with Jim and record the open and the close and the middle stuff and, and put it all together. And that's kind of what they do. You know, he has uh, interviews banked. He and, he and Mark open the the podcast, they talk about what's going on. I don't do that because I'm trying to be an evergreen podcast, so I don't really ever talk about current events happening yeah. currently. Uh, and then they play the interview, and then they talk about that a little bit. So that was sort of my template. I knew that uh, having listened to many, many podcasts where there was literally no editing going on, I knew I was going to do a lot of editing primarily because I wanted to keep it to about an hour. So if I have a 20 minute chapter and a 30 minute interview and in another 10 minutes of bantering around, um, I've got to get the interview cut down. And I also don't want to waste people's time. So I, I'm just trying to give them, here's the key stuff that was said. And some of the tangents uh, I cut out, there have been instances where the tangents have been really interesting and have been a nice 20 minute tangent. I will often just take that and post it on YouTube as a bonus for that episode. So we'll say in the episode, uh, you know, we had a great time uh, talking to John Armstrong uh, about what it's like to be a magic consultant. By the way, he also had some great stories about his time on Penn and Teller's Fool Us. Go to the show notes, click on the link, you can go to our YouTube page, and you can hear that story. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'm not the first to do it, obviously. I've heard other people do it. Some of them were doing it as sort of a uh, Patreon thing, and I decided early on I didn't want to do any of that because I'm asking people to listen and maybe buy a book. And that's kind of all the ad I need. I don't need any more advertising in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also just didn't want this stuff to go away. It's like, well, you know, this is an interesting story. It's 20 minutes long. We've got one coming out in a couple of weeks where the uh, our guest is Mike Close, who is the uh, magic consultant on Penn and Teller Fool Us. And he talks about that whole process. But then he also had a great thing where he talked about uh, why when he's doing restaurant magic and he comes to a table, he stands up and a very revered magician who died a couple years ago named Eugene Berger would always want to sit down when he did restaurant magic and what they're thinking is why they want to do that. Well, it had no real place in our episode because our episode at that point was about being a magic consultant, but I knew that would be interesting to a certain percentage of the audience. So boom, that becomes a video that's just a bonus thing that you can click on and listen to. For my listeners, James Blatch from The Self-Publishing Show was on episode six of Who Makes a Podcast, uh, running a podcasting company and teaching self-publishing with James Blatch. So you can look that up. It's a really good interview. Thank you. Are there any books that you may have read that have affected how you're making your podcast? Honestly, no, I've not. That I have not. Uh, it really has just been listening to, for example, the Dana Gould Hour podcast was very instrumental because he does a really good job of editing his interviews and it's more common now but when you know five six years ago when people were popping out podcasts so many of them were just hit record talk 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 talk, 90 minutes later hit stop and put it out which is fine and that certainly works but i wanted something that was more produced and dana gould on his podcast was uh not overproduced but clearly some thought had been put into it and things had been taken out and segues had been made. And, and uh, that was what I was aiming for. Do you have a particular editing routine or, or style that you're, that you're working with? What are you doing when you're working in your editing, your audio software? Like, what are you looking for when you're editing your episodes? Well, you know, they're done in pieces. So the audiobooks are all done and those are in a file. So when it comes time to do that episode that has that particular chapter, I can pull that out. Generally, my interviews are done ahead of time 
uh, well ahead of time usually because my co-host Jim, uh, as a performer, has a erratic schedule. And so when I know he's going to have openings in his schedule, I try to schedule interviews so we can get a bunch of them done so I can backlog those. So um, when it comes to putting together an episode, we get together on Zoom. I put together an outline of what's going to happen. Uh, we go through the, the segments, which are the, the welcome, which sets up the interview. And then we have a discussion about the interview, which segues into introducing that chapter, which means sort of recapping what happened in last episode's chapter. And then out of that chapter, we do we do a wrap up. So we can do our stuff in 20 minutes to a half hour. And I do that on Zoom and I record it uh, where it saves on my desktop and not in the cloud because I found after a while, which they told you this, but they don't, they probably do. I just didn't look deep enough that when I save it on my desktop, they will give me a main file and then his track and my track. So if I need to break things up or just drop my side out while he's talking or something, I can do that. And then I just go ahead, I, I edit in Final Cut Pro, which is really a video editing program, but it's the one I'm used to. Yep. And it allows me to do multiple tracks of audio. Uh, and I will just lay down uh, what Jim and I did. And I do a first pass where I just take out all the gunk and I take out all of my ums and ahs. I leave in a lot of his because he has sort of a charming, stammering, stumbling way of talking. <laughs> So I leave in a lot of his stuff because it's pretty charming. Does he know that he you polish yourself up a lot? I don't then, think he's and figured then you that out leave yet. Him, leave him high and dry with the ums? Well, it's not just leaving him high and dry with the ums. It's <laughs> uh, if, you, if you listen, you'll hear that he has a really fun way of getting into a sentence sometimes. So I will leave that in. I will uh, kind of keep an eye on the clock as I'm editing and say, all right, that's a charming little tangent we took, but we don't have time for that. So I'll cut that out. And then I will also leave holes... Uh, and I can drop in the interview, and then I drop in the chapter, and I have this timeline, so I can look at the timeline and go, all right, well, I'm at one hour and 15 minutes. i got to go back in and take out more of us because I'm not really – because the, the interview at that point is as tight as I want to get it. I don't want to take any more of that out. And then um, it's just a question then of uh, cleaning it up, uh, adding the, the music and the opening and closing credits and all that. And then I have to save it out, and then I – do another process where it, it's a processing thing where it kind of even it evens everything out, and then I throw it into a podcast creation program uh, called Podcast Chapters, and I break it into chapters or I indicate where the chapters are, which is something that I found on a podcast called Script Notes that I really liked because there were things in Script Notes that I didn't always want to listen to. Anyway, if you go to the menu, it'll say, "Oh, just jump here. You can jump the next two things." So. I make sure that every podcast is indexed so that if, for example, there may be people who want to start the podcast and don't care about the interview but want to hear the next chapter, so they can just jump to that. I also make a point of putting in where that next chapter starts uh, in the show notes so that if if when they're listening, if they're, I'm assuming there are some people who don't really care about the interviews but want to listen to the whole book and so they want that next chapter. Uh, and then... Once that's all done, it's, that's what's gone through the podcast chapters thing. I will do a, uh, a YouTube version of it, which is just the sound with a graphic for that episode. So people, if they want to listen to it on YouTube, they can. A certain number of them do, and they seem to like that. So that's fine. And then I go ahead and I am on Squarespace, which is where I, uh, I publish it out of, and I just put it on Squarespace and, and set it up. So it's it's a bunch of steps. It's a lot more work than I certainly thought going in. Yeah, um, There's a lot more steps, and I'm glad that I do it uh, every two weeks because if a few months went by, I would definitely forget. And I'm always terrified because occasionally you'll, I'll turn on my uh, phone and look at a podcast that I've downloaded from someone else, and it'll say there's no content here. It's like, oh, my goodness, somebody here put out their podcast, and they didn't. They skipped a step somehow, and it went everywhere, and it's not there. So I'm always very nervous about making sure that I've followed all the correct steps and that it is, in fact, adhering and, and being sent out. I've never heard of podcast chapters, but, and I'm, I've just looked at my, like my podcast app that I listen to podcasts in, and I, I don't see chapters in there. Is that a, like an Apple-specific thing, or how, do you know how that works? It may be. Let me just look here. Um, I know YouTube has chapters. Do, do those carry over to your YouTube post no i don't i don't no. do that okay it may not be on all podcasts 
I just knew that I wanted to be able to offer that in yeah. mine. That's interesting. And do you use Apple Podcasts to listen to your podcasts? No, I no? use okay. a, a program called Overcast. Okay. They're the ones who download all this stuff for me. And, and yeah, it's just because a, a techie friend of mine said uh, he recommended Overcast. So that's what I went with because I don't know what I'm doing and he does. <laughs> Fair enough. Did you say you use Squarespace for distribution? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have my websites. I have three websites. And you have a blog option that you yep. can put on your web page. And um, I just did a little digging, and they it was pretty easy to do to get the RSS feed set okay. up through them. And it's worked very nicely. So they provided you the RSS feed, and then you went out and, and gave that RSS feed to Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. I, yeah, I went to all, and all the that. places and, and gave them to them, yep. Cool. And then that's just included in your web hosting, I assume. Yep. Awesome. What kind of history did you have with audio recording before getting into podcasting? I know you said that you did film stuff, and obviously audio is a big part of, of making films. Like, What kind of decisions did you have to make when you were picking out your podcasting equipment? Um, I kind of already had virtually everything I needed because I was doing audiobooks. Okay. So I already had a Blue Yeti mic, and I had the laptop, and I had the program, and I knew how to edit stuff, although I wasn't necessarily always doing in charge of sound when I was making the low-budget features. I was usually directing between that and the corporate events and corporate videos where I'd work with sound people. I kind of, uh, via osmosis, learned enough to make me dangerous Yeah, where I can make something work. I'm, I'm that guy. I can turn it on. As soon as something doesn't work, I'm useless. <laughs> but if everything's working, then I can, I can make it work. And like I say, because I'd done the audiobooks, I had the microphone for that. I had the program for that. And then it was just a question of figuring out how, what format I wanted to do it in, how, you know, how did I want to introduce it? How often did I want to do it? All that stuff. Are you still using the Blue Yeti? Uh, the Blue Yeti is in the other room, which I have set up for audiobooks. Uh, I'm using the Yeti Nano for this right now. Okay. On one side, and then on my other side, I have my little Zoom recorder recording my half of the conversation in case anything goes wonky at your end. Yep. And then you said you, was it Final Cut? Yep. Is that what you're using? Okay. Final Cut Pro, yeah. That's your editing software of choice. It is. I know that, you know, it's <clears throat> maybe a little overkill for what I'm doing. Uh, and I know there are probably sound programs that are just devoted to sound that are better. But I really know how it works, and it allows me to do... Uh, you know, as as many layers as I want of sound. It is um, delightful when it comes to if you need to sync. For example, when I get the main audio back from Zoom and it gives me my audio and Jim's audio separately, yeah. I can just throw those on a timeline and say, sync these up. They sync them up. I adjust our volumes and are more often running. Um, and on, a, on those occasions that I've also been shooting video to go with the to go with the podcast, there have only been a couple instances of that. It's been very nice to have everything in the same program. Yeah, I use Reaper for my DAW, for my audio recording. Mm -hmm. But I just started dabbling in DaVinci Resolve for some video editing stuff. And they have a, a really impressive audio suite just built into DaVinci nice. that they give away for free. It's all just, you know, I mean, you could pay for the, the studio version that's got more video effects and stuff but the audio software that's built into davinci is is super impressive but yeah i, I, I like reaper i use it because uh, i'm accustomed to it yeah that's i mean when james watch and i were talking about this very same topic he, he said the same thing he's used to editing in final cut pro and premiere yeah. because of his background in video and you just stick with it if you can and in my case there's no reason not to just because it it does everything i need and more yeah where did the music come from for your podcast? It it sounds so familiar to me when I listen to it. It's like I've heard that before. Well, I bought that piece of music when we started the audiobooks, and that is the theme that I use for Eli Marks. I know that other podcasts have used it. They've also bought it and used it. Okay. Uh, but it was sort of a branded thing. I wanted to just keep that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that you know, as soon as you hear that, you know you're you're in the right podcast. Yeah. So I may have heard it before then. And that, that would make sense, yeah. You sure could have. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I got my um, my little intro clip from uh, the YouTube Studio Music Library because it's mm -hmm. royalty-free and, and all of that. So I'm sure there's probably somebody using that clip somewhere else as well. Yeah. 
How big is your podcast? How many listens and, and downloads and stuff are you getting? Chris, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know and I don't care. Yeah. And actually, uh, we just had a discussion about this on our last episode, which I think will be our next episode. I think it hasn't gone out yet. The purpose of it is I want people to be able to listen to an Eli Marks book for free. I want to be able to do it now or 10 years from now, which is why I try to keep it evergreen so it never feels dated. And it doesn't cost me anything to do it, so I don't have to make money back. And so I've never really looked into it. I know I'm getting you know, emails from people in Switzerland, Germany, and Brighton, England. So people are listening to it. And I know uh, that audiobook sales have gone up since we started doing it. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be my next question. You know, it's independent publishing, book selling like I'm doing. It's really hard to quantify what's doing what. For example, I just started putting videos up on TikTok about 10 days ago. And I've noticed an uptick in book sales. Now, is that because of TikTok? Or is that because people who've been reading the free copy of the ambitious card that they can get on any of the book sites have decided to buy the next book and are, you know, are just moving through the series? It's always hard to tell what is having an impact and what. But I do know that audiobook sales have gone up quite a bit in the last year, and that's how long we've been doing the podcast. So I, I think what I wanted to have happen was have people listen to it and either go, oh, I want to hear the next book, or I don't have the patience to wait to hear the end of, hear the end of this book. Yeah. No, I think that that's pretty clever. I think that's a great way to use a podcast. Well, I hope so. And I hope people enjoy it. I, I, that's why I wanted to do more than just give them the book. Yeah. I wanted there to be something else in there because I, I have heard from listeners who have said, I've already read all the Eli Marks books, but I'm loving the interviews and I'm loving hearing the books again read by Jim. Yeah. So they're listening for, you know, they've read them before, but now they're listening to him do them. And I've always felt, I think I'm allowed to say this as the writer, that it's a better experience to have Jim read them to you than it is for you to read them because he really gets it and he understands where the jokes are and he's making my okay writing seem a whole lot better than it is by the way he's performing it. Are you writing more books in this series? There is at least one more coming out that's going to be part of, part of a special promotions next year. Uh, and I've got ideas for more. I just haven't, like I said, the podcast takes up a whole lot more time than I thought it was going to. I'm, I mean, I'm glad I'm doing it, but it, in order to make it sound the way I want, uh, it, it, it just takes a while. Okay. And then the follow-up question to that would be, given your podcasts every other week, one chapter every other week, you want to do a book a year. Do you feel like on a future book that you write, or is that going to confine you to 26 chapters? Um, no. Will that affect the writing at all? No? No, it won't. There's actually only 24 because it's twice a month. Oh, I see. Okay. It's, yeah, it's the second and fourth Monday of the month. Okay. Uh, worked out very nicely with The Ambitious Card, which was the first book because that had 23 chapters. And then we did a special bonus episode, which was just uh, uh, an interview with a magician named Mike Super, who is uh, off the, out of the East Coast and is really, really good. And then we, uh, we played one of the short stories. Uh, for this season, which is the second book in the series, The Bullet Catch, there are 26 chapters in that one. And so there are two episodes coming up in the fall that will have uh, two chapters per episode, and we'll have shorter interviews, those two, chap two, two episodes to try to, it's still going to be 90 minutes long each, but try to keep them a little shorter. Yeah. Given the evergreen nature of the podcast that you're making, you already have the audiobooks. they're done, they're recorded. Have you, how far ahead are you? Like, are, have you actually recorded the interview and made the episodes for like book three, chapter 12? No. Like you're that far no. ahead? No. No, we are about, uh, f when it comes to interviews, I think about four interviews shy of being done with season two. So we're recording this. Am I allowed to tell you? Yeah. You talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. So we're recording this in early April and I've got interviews recorded and edited through the end of August. And I have, I think the two September ones already booked and an idea for the last, no, that must be September, October. Cause I have four more that I need for uh, November, December. So you're working about four or four or five months ahead at this point. 
I do, because like I mentioned, Jim works at the Renaissance Festival in the summer, and he it's only Saturdays and Sundays, but he spends all day yelling. So he is useless <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the following week because his voice is just gone. So I can get him. Uh, we can do stuff on Thursday and Friday in August and September. But so I try to get as much stuff backlogged as I can. Yeah. No, it, I mean, I'm just thinking it would be it'd be kind of nice if you just had like eight books worth of podcast episodes done and, and ready to go. And now you're you're set for the next, you know, seven or eight years as far as your podcast goes. Yes. I, it would be I'm a not ton that, of work up front, but it would be. No, I'm yeah, unfortunately no. I'm almost done with this year. Yeah. How are you how are you booking your guests, your your magicians that you have coming on as guests? What's the process that you're going through to book them? It's usually just an email. Uh, most of them you can contact them through their websites. Uh, there have been a couple instances where the websites weren't available. They didn't have a contact information on it. And so I would go to a, you know, because it's such a small community, I can just reach out and say, hey, do you have an email for so-and-so? And I'm generally able to get that. Uh, there have been instances where I've gone through their IMDB page or, you know, publicist. For example, we had the talk show host Dick Cavett on last year. And Dick Cavett is not really accessible, but he does have a publicist. And so I sent an email to his publicist and explained, you know, Mr. Cavett has a lifelong interest in magic. Uh, there's particular things we want to talk to him about, about guests he had on his show. Uh, and that's that's how we got to him. Whereas a few weeks later, we had the amazing Kreskin and he was I just reached out to him via his website. And he got back to me and said, sure, I'd love to do it. And as I mentioned, there are other ones that are generally people who have have some form of magic background don't do it anymore, but are still interested in it. Uh, like I said, the Neil Patrick Harris's of the world, the Jason Alexander's, the J.J. Abrams, uh, people like that. I've tried reaching out and and I'm not really getting anywhere with them, uh, which is fine. I'm okay by I'm okay with that. Uh, I'd love to talk to them, but it's okay that we're not. I've got plenty of other interesting magicians we can talk to as well. And when somebody says yes, they want to come on, are you doing it kind of the old fashioned way with uh, you send them a, a list of times that you're available? Yeah, I'm working with a magician we've been trying to get for a while who's been very busy, and he finally emailed today and said, "I'm I'm I'm open next week after Tuesday." And so that at that point, it's a text off to Jim saying. How's your Wednesday look? All yeah. right, Wednesday afternoon, good. Email to the guy. How about Wednesday afternoon at 3? He emails back about 3.30. Fine, I'll send you a link where I'll set to go. And that's generally how it goes. You know, when are you available? And then we make it work. If for some reason it's time sensitive, if 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 you like, uh, you, you, if there's a sense that I might lose them and Jim's just not available. Um, for example, there's a, a duo in uh, England called Morgan and West, who are fantastic magicians and really, really smart and able to speak about it quite eloquently. It's not just the accent. They really are saying very smart things. And Jim simply wasn't available at the time they were available because there was a like a six or seven hour time difference and he was busy. So on a couple occasions, I have done the interviews on my own, but I always try to include him whenever I can because um, you know, we're not getting paid for this. And uh, that's the thing he loves is being able to uh, talk to these people who in many cases are heroes of his. Do you use any kind of notes or outline while you're doing your interviews? Yeah, I always work out about 10 questions that I want to make sure we hit. It it helps that we're talking generally about very specific things. Yeah. We're not talking career spanning stuff. So that helps. And then, you know, sometimes the conversation goes off on a thing and you just go with it. And how are you how are you driving growth to your podcast? Obviously you're coming on podcast. <laughs> I, I know you're probably, you know, maybe not even trying to do that. You're not you're not tracking Chris, stats. I'm but, not tracking it so yeah. if, if I can't measure it, I, I can't <laughs> grow it. Yeah. That but, was the argument I always had with my old publisher where they'd say, We want you to market the books and I'd say, Tell me how much they're selling every day. They'd say, We can't tell you that and I said, Yeah, then I can't help you. If I don't have numbers, I can't help you. But you are doing some stuff, right? Because you went on the yes. self-publishing show with James. You're coming on this podcast with yep. me. Are you going on other podcasts? Is 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 being a guest on a podcast just a a, a fun hobby for you? Or are you? Is there an active uh, a, that a was reason an active, for it? Yes, that's 
there's three reasons why I would do it. One is promote the podcast. The other would be to promote the mystery series of books. Mm -hmm. Third one is because I have a background in filmmaking and have written a couple nonfiction books on how to make movies. Um, I also end up on filmmaking podcasts as well. And that was something that I decided during uh, the uh, lockdown that I thought, well, th here's something I can do to promote these three areas. That's only going to cost time. There's no money involved. And as a podcast host myself, I know that uh, people never mind when you email and say, do you need someone on your podcast on this topic? Yeah. The answer may be no. Uh, but on the other hand, it may be, yes, thank you. I That's perfect. Yes. And how many, how many times have you been a guest on a podcast? I've actually lost count, but I would guess really? I'm probably, yeah. Well, you know, keep in mind, I'm not very good at counting, but it's, <laughs> it's at least a couple dozen for sure. That's fun. It is. It's not, it's not a bad way to spend your time. Yeah. And you've been on uh, James's podcast twice, right? Yes. I'm, I was very surprised that he wanted me on the second time, but we had talked about it during the first interview, this idea I had about the podcast and the fact that then I just emailed him kind of in passing saying, you know, it's been a year later and it's actually seems to be working. And I was surprised to get an email right back from him saying, let's do this. And then we recorded it and it was like the next week it was up. So they used it very quickly as well, which, which I thought was very interesting because I have some really good interviews for my podcast that I'm sitting on that I yeah. won't be able to, I mean, I'd, I'd love to just release them all at once. It doesn't make any sense, but I mean, I've got actual big names coming up in the fall. That's like, Oh, that's cool. And they got to wait. Yeah. I mean, you know, I interviewed him and then he was on my podcast and then he interviewed you about making your podcast. And I, I honestly felt like, you know, James Blatch, you got to stay in your lane a little bit. I mean, you're talking about <laughs> self-publishing books coming on to my podcast to learn a new way to make podcasts and now you're going to go take it and <laughs> yes but i learned about your podcast when he talked about it on his podcast i know i know so and, and a I, lot I of people greatly listen appreciate to his podcast that. greatly appreciate that no james is a fantastic guest and i'd love to have him on again um i had a ton of fun talking to him and i will say he was just recently on another podcast i won't mention it i want to uh and didn't mention it at all on self-publishing. So oh. he was, yeah. So, you know, I, I, you should be glad that he mentioned you. Yeah, really I am. I am. Yeah. Very happy. Um, I had, I had a great time talking to James. He was, he's, he's a great. really, he's a really good interviewer. You don't even feel like you're being interviewed. You're just chatting with James. Yeah. You told me before we started that you have started a second podcast called the occasionally, the occasional the, film, the podcast. occasional film podcast. Yeah. What's, what's that about? Well, that's the other side of me, the filmmaker side. Um, like I say, I've written a couple books on how to produce low-budget movies or how to write screenplays for low-budget movies. And in order to um, put those books together, I ended up interviewing a lot of filmmakers, some big names like Roger Corman, who I think everybody knows Roger Corman's name, um, and some lesser known but still very, very skillful filmmakers. And I, I uh, had a lot of stuff left over. So I started doing a blog uh, where I would print longer form versions of the interviews that I was not able to use in the book. And then I did, um, I tried some audio uh, interviews, I don't know, four or five years ago. And that uh, I tried to do a podcast maybe through SoundCloud and it wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't really up to speed in what I was doing. And so I sort of abandoned it and it went away. But I realized I had these assets of these interviews. And they're pretty good interviews. For example, the the primary one that'll go up uh, after our introductory one is with Jonathan Lynn, who directed My Cousin Vinny and the movie Clue. I loved My Cousin Vinny. I love that movie. Yeah, he. Um, uh, it's not in that uh, interview. I don't think. I think it was off mic when we said it. But I, I complimented him on. I said there's no movie that comes to a conclusion faster and better than My Cousin Vinny. And he said that was his biggest problem with the script, which he loved. He was given Dale Honor's script and he loved the script, but he said, I can't have I can't have a jury go out and come back. I've, it's got to be done. He's got to say, case dismissed. And that's what I think is one of the reasons that movie is as successful as it is, is that it really ties up perfectly, very, very quickly. And he was great to talk to. So anyway, I had these recordings and I had other people I wanted to talk to. And I know how to do the podcast now. 
And I thought, well, why don't I just do one occasionally, which is breaking one of the cardinal rules of podcasting, which is you're supposed to have a regular schedule so that listeners know when it's coming out. And I thought, well, that's fine. They're getting that with uh, Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast. But when I have stuff that I want to put out on the other one, I'll just do it. I'll just put it out. And that's the purpose of it. I think uh, I think Jim will be co-hosting some of it. I will have other people. I'll have occasional co-hosts because it's an occasional film podcast. Some of them I'll do myself. Some I'll have other people on. And it's just sort of like the books in that the, the overall general focus is how do you make a movie uh, without breaking the bank? I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a great podcast. Again, I don't know if more than one person will listen to it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it And you just, won't know, probably. <clears throat> I won't know. No. And <laughs> if somebody tries to tell me, I will just slam the door in their face. I don't want to know. I think if, if either one of them becomes really, really successful, I would somehow find that out. I think that news would get back to me somehow. You would think so. Yeah, you'd think so. Maybe when I hear Jimmy Kimmel make a joke about it, I'll right. go, oh, it must, we must have broken through somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And so that one's just getting started now. This is it is as we're the, as uh, we're recording this as we're beginning of April. The, yep. Yeah, it'll come out. Um, the first episode will be out. Uh, what is next Wednesday, the thirteenth of April? Cool. Yeah, that one will drop April thirteenth. And are you going to be cross promoting it on your other podcast, or is there, are these separate separate entities, separate things? You don't want to. Yeah, I'm not going to cross the streams. Yeah, I don't think. I think uh, just because I don't know it it. People think of podcasts as being, you know, hey, I got today's podcast. I got, you know, the new one. To, you know, the self-publishing show comes out on Friday. I got the new one. Yeah. But in reality, this is just a library of stuff that people can look back on mm -hmm. years from now. So I don't, you know, I don't want to make it seem like something that's happening today. It's just, it's something you can, it's a resource you can go to whenever you want. The only thing I say is that I, and I've said this a number of times on the Eli Marks podcast, I'm putting links in the show notes with the understanding that they may not work when you get them, but yeah. I'm telling you they, they worked today. Fair enough. Yeah. So podcasting seems like uh, something that you have taken up that you really enjoy doing at this point. Where do you see it going in the future? Your, your podcast and then podcasting as a whole? Well, I don't know if you remember back in the, you don't, you're Mark Partier, back in the 80s, um, there were a lot of Elvis impersonators uh -huh. and someone worked out mathematically that if it continued to that point, that one out of three people would eventually be an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> <clears throat> and the same, I think, is sort of true of podcasting. Uh, the number of people who are starting podcasts just gets becomes more and more. But I also think that the ones that have more than 10 episodes are less common. I think if people start them and then they fall by the wayside because it's hard. It is. It's just, it's you know, not hard like digging ditches, but, you know, you're trying to produce a nice piece of quality sound every couple of weeks and come up with good content. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure in the long run that most people want to do that. I think they want to consume it, but I don't necessarily want to do it. So I think they're around forever. Um, it'll be interesting to see how, how they change. You know, so many of them now have a video element that yep. you can have. I don't necessarily care for that just because it's people sitting in front of a microphone it's like watching howard stern it's like well they're they're in front of a microphone but yeah i think uh i don't know if we're in the golden age of it but it certainly is fun doing it and it's so easy i mean it's it's work but it's pretty easy to do yeah definitely something that anybody could pick up and run with if they you know just gave it a little bit of time learn yep. how to do it figure the the technology out it's it's so much easier to do now than it was five, 10 years ago. There are so many more services available that help you distribute it and make it. And yeah, it's definitely, it definitely seems like a growing thing that people can get behind. Although, like you said, probably not many of them are going to stick around for the long term. Yeah, it's, it's just that's a lot of content to create. You know, it was easy for us with Eli Marks because we already had, you know, virtually half of every episode already in the can before we started because all the chapters were done. There was nothing else that needed to be done with the audiobooks. So that, that's that's a big leg up. Yeah, that definitely would help. All right. What would you say is one of the most important lessons that you have learned about podcasting since you started making your podcast? Well, besides the fact that it's harder than it looks, which I was surprised by, 
much in the, in the same way that I learned to write novels, and I did that by reading mysteries and listening to audiobooks of mysteries. And it's just learning, kind of getting the muscle memory of how do you do that? How does that work? What is the structure? You, you get it into your system by just absorbing a lot of it. If I hadn't listened to a lot of podcasts, uh, I, I'd be lost because I was able to listen to a lot of different examples of what is a podcast and decide, okay, well, what's my version of that? And couldn't have done that if I hadn't had so many different, varied examples to listen to. So that's my advice to anybody is, you know, back when I was in the corporate world, on more than one occasion, I would be in a meeting with a client and someone in the room would say, we should do a podcast. And this is five, six years ago. And I would say, what do you mean by that? And they'd say, we want to do, the company wants to put out a podcast. I said, all right, you've said the word podcast twice. What do you mean? And what they meant was they wanted to put out a half hour radio show once. Mm-hmm. And they didn't understand the concept of a podcast is it's, you know, can be certain like can be like uh, the podcast serial, which is we're going to do 12 episodes on this thing. Yep. Or it can be a group of idiots sitting in a room just chatting about current events every week. But it's a thing. It's a you've created a structure and you've promising an audience uh, you're going to get this when we promised you're going to get it and we're going to. We've made a promise to you that it's going to be like this and uh, stay with us as long as we continue to do that. And that's hard to do. I mean, you're creating a a thing that's going to go out every week or two weeks. It's probably a little easier for a serial or or something like that where they know where the guardrails are. They know we're starting here, we're ending there. Yeah. That gives them a nice shape. For people who are in a more freeform uh, situation where... They're interviewing a different guest every week, like a Mark Marin. I mean, he can do that forever. Right. But part of the problem with that structure is I'm only going to really listen probably if I'm interested in the guest. And if I'm not interested in the guest, then I'm probably going to skip Mark Marin that week, which means his advertisers are not going to be getting to me that week. And so he has to keep upping the ante and um, having great guests, unless you've got like smart lists. With Jason Bateman and Will Arnett that and podcast. Sean Hayes, yeah, that's fun. In which it kind of doesn't matter who the guest is because they're going to have a lot of fun, and you're going to listen because of those three guys. And that's a different sort of thing than Mark Marin talking to somebody who's was a drummer in a band I never heard of. Probably not going to listen to that. Whereas I'm, I want to hear how is Will Arnett going to take Jason Bateman down this week. I know that there are podcasters who complain that there are celebrities doing podcasts. You know, what is Conan O'Brien doing a podcast? Conan O'Brien likes entertaining people. He likes talking to people. But do I listen to his podcast? If there's a guest on that I'm interested in, yes. If he, is he taking calls from people? Then I'm probably not going to listen to that because I don't really care mm-hmm. about that. If you've got a structure that people like and you make a promise to them and you fulfill it, they're going to keep coming back. I think that's a pretty good place to start wrapping up. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Did we miss anything that you wanted to make sure that we covered? No, I think we're good. I'm hoping that uh, at some point uh, someone interviews you about how you make your podcast. That would be... Maybe maybe you want to get in a little further before before that happens. Yeah, I I need to find somebody um, who's, who's interviewing people making podcasts about how to make podcasts so they can interview me how i make my podcast well i could just do a a a single episode and i'll record the questions and then i'll record the answer you laugh but you know uh, you could easily end up falling down that rabbit hole at some point in the podcast world john i've had a fantastic time talking to you this has been a lot of fun for me me too chris it's been fun where can people find you where do you want to send them Oh, boy, where would I send them? Um, if they go to elimarksmysteries.com, that's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S mysteries.com, and uh, click on the podcast button there, they can listen to um, the Behind the Page, Eli Marks podcast. Uh, they can listen to, now that we're in season two, they can listen to all of season one and hear all of the ambitious card. Uh, they can listen to as much of the bullet catch as we've done so far now. If they want to go to fastcheapfilm.com, that's Fast Cheap Film, uh, they can click on the podcast button there or uh, and get the podcast. Click on the blog if they want to read uh, interviews 
with uh, filmmakers like John Favreau and Steven Soderbergh and uh, Roger Corman. Uh, yeah, those two are probably the two best places to go. Cool. And if they wanted to buy a book, also at the Elan Marks Mysteries website? Uh, they can go there, uh, which would uh, either allow them to buy the ebook or the audio book directly from me, or uh, having link, it has links that allows them to buy it from any of the top five online retailers for the paperback, ebook, audiobook, and hardcovers. Awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me here on Who Makes a Podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. That was my conversation with John Gaspard, author, film producer, and co-host of Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, which can be found on all of the major podcast networks. You can also find John at elimarksmysteries.com. My name is Chris Cookley, and you can find me at whomakesapodcast.com. And if you host a podcast and would like to be my next guest on Who Makes a Podcast, let me know. Go to whomakesapodcast.com slash guest and tell me about your show. If you enjoyed this episode, it would be an enormous help if you shared it with your friends or left a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. It helps other podcast lovers find the show. This is Who Makes a Podcast. I'll be back next time with another conversation with another incredible podcast host. Thanks for listening.